So this is a, a welcome, a welcome return to some form of normality. So we must be past seven o'clock. Seven o'clock on the dot. Yeah. I, my um, my parents were uh, very, very, um, very good at being very disciplined, and uh, they never opened a drink before six o'clock in the evening. So we had the expression, "The sun's over the yard arm." So I know that we're at seven o'clock, but it's a similar sort of feeling that we've all been sitting here watching a bottle before we're allowed to open it. But here we are, and actually, we're going to open a can first. So. <laughs> What I've suggested this time, I think I did last time as well, but maybe if you've got two glasses, the idea of this session is a little bit more to be able to taste wine side by side. So you don't have to, if you want to try one and then move on to the other one, then that's absolutely fine. But I'm going to try and compare and contrast a little bit. We're going to talk about the different ages of the wine, the different, with the first two that we're going to try, we're going to talk about the different techniques that are used to make the wine and, and why it might taste slightly different. Uh, and then we'll look at the different vintages with the Coleridge Hill, which is a 2017 and a 2019. And then we're going to look at the um, Pinot Noir, which I think is quite an interesting comparison because it's comparing 2017 and 2018, which were two very, very different years. And uh, also it's Pinot Noir, which is quite, uh, um, uh, quite a versatile grape and shows what can be done in different years. So without further ado, if you haven't already, so I can't see you, so you may have already poured, I'm going to pour uh, a little can of uh, what's called dry white fizz. When, what, just a little bit before we start, I'm sure you've all opened your cases if you have, uh, if you have got the virtual wine uh, taste, uh, case. Uh, there's a six pack and a 12 pack. If you've got the six pack, then you've just got the wines that we're trying tonight. If you've got the 12 pack, then there's also a Sigareba in there, the 17 and an 18, which uh, you can either call it your homework or uh, a little bit of welcome relief without me talking all the time as well. So you can try that at your leisure. So we launched our cans this time last year and we launched them really for the on trade. And we gave one of our uh, major trade customers a, a sort of head start and said that we would uh, let them use it exclusively. It was quite, um, quite well received. There is a little bit of a, a stigma attached to cans, which I think is, is breaking down. And where we were making great strides was uh, the, the fact that it's, it's so recyclable. So very, very handy. No glass, and there's so many people that have a no glass policy now in the on trade. And also it crushes down to nothing. And I believe that a can becomes a can again in about seven days after you've put it into a can bank. So it's a very, very efficient recycling. Uh, method. So, I've opened the first one. There we go. So, we, um, if you were with us on the last, I tell you what, we ought to do a poll first because then I know who I'm talking to. So, Elaine's going to, whilst we're, we're just trying this one, Elaine's going to launch the first poll. Elaine's my trusted assistant who's behind the camera. There we go. I just, we'd just like to know a little bit about uh, whether you've been on, if you've done any of these virtual tastings before or not. And then that helps me to, rather than saying the same, same thing over again, or things that mean nothing to you, uh, it enables me to um, gauge things a little bit. So all you've got to do is select a number, I think, and then it will, come up. I haven't got my glasses on so I can't see what's happening. So I'll carry on talking about this wine whilst you're doing that. So the first thing to notice on it is the fact that very, for me that there aren't many bubbles. There's a little bit and I'll be perfectly honest that we didn't get as much fizz into this as I really wanted to. This was our first effort at doing this and so it really is a semi-sparkling. So but it, it gives quite a nice little pétillance. It's been in can for a little while now and I think it's just it's showing its age a little bit, not in a bad way, but, but wines tend to, uh, to lose a little bit of their freshness. But, but when they lose the freshness, they gain a little bit more complexity as well. So this was the first time, as I said, we put, put wine into a can. And so we've learned a little bit about what we're trying to do. And, and the first 
The first thing is that it's a still wine with a little bit more acidity to it, uh, which we've added some bubbles to. So it's still got a little bit of fruit character. How are we doing on the Yeah, I've finished on the, the test. I'll show the results. Here. Yeah. Can you see them on your screen? I can see something, but I can't read it because I've got my glasses okay, on. So and I don't look nearly as good with glasses on, so I'll try not to wear them. <laughs> uh, so um, so yeah, so uh, forty one percent of you have you shared it? So can everybody else see it? Yeah, so you can see that uh, a lot of people have been to both tastings before. Um, and uh, we obviously hit the wrong day for the second one, but uh, um, so but then again, thirty thirty eight percent of you haven't done one before, which is yeah, which is interesting. So I, it's it's a significant number, so I will say a few things that I will that some of you might have heard before. Uh, some of you might have drunk all the wine and therefore can't remember what I said before anyway, so uh, it's quite good revision. Uh, yes, that's uh, that's great. So the first wine, a little sniff of it. The thing about sparkling wines is you, you do the, the, the bubbles in it do tend to lift the wine from the glass, and so you get quite a lot of fruit character coming off. And then I have a little taste. So there's a lot more bubble on, on the palate than there is in the glass. And so there's a very, very distinct difference between the method of getting the bubbles in for this can. Um, the can is basically a still wine, as I said, and we inject CO2 into it uh, as it goes into the can so that we end up with the pressure in the can. And as I, I hate to say it, but it's a very similar method that you would use in, in most fizzy drinks in a can. But it's still, is a very a good way of getting a little bit of freshness and a little bit of zest into a, into a wine. It's meant for fairly quick early drinking. Uh, wine doesn't age particularly well in a can. So this is a 187 mil single serve and uh, we'll be producing some more of these probably in the next month to six weeks and then we'd like to see those moving through within the next nine months to a year. So it's very much for young drinking but ideal for uh, taking on a picnic or uh, sneaking into your handbag if you're going somewhere where you feel like you might need a drink. <laughs> uh, so let's compare that with our classic cuvee, which is a sparkling wine made by the traditional method. Now we're not allowed to use the words um, method champenoise, but it is the same method that's used in Champagne. And one of the questions I asked on the first session, which I'm not going to ask again, is what nationality was the person that discovered traditional sparkling wine? And the answer was an Englishman. And somebody, because it was our first tasting and we hadn't got all of our controls right, somebody shouted out Christopher Merritt. And they were exactly right. And he was actually born in, uh, in Winchcombe, just uh, the other side of Gloucestershire. And he discovered uh, second fermentation in a bottle uh, about 20 years before um, Don Perignon. So we are the, uh, the inventors of, of sparkling wines in bottle, in traditional method. So you might remember if you did the first tasting, and if you don't, if you weren't here, then this is a little tip. Wash your glass out with some sparkling wine, or well, not sparkling, any, any wine really, still wine, especially if you wash your glasses in detergent or, um, it's, it's far better to wash them just in hot water and to leave them to drain because it will affect the bubbles. So, excuse me, now I'm just gonna pour this little bit away. If you've got five or six of you together, rather than all pouring it in and pouring it away, one person can pour it in. Swill it around a little bit and pass it on to the next one. You can swill it around and pass it on so you're not wasting too much wine. But it can make a really big difference to how the wine performs in the glass. Let's have a look and see if we get it right this time. So what we're comparing here is a wine that's been uh, fermented and then put back into a very strong bottle with some yeast and some more sugar and a second fermentation happens in the bottle 
the uh, bubbles uh, will stay in the wine and the wine will, but the bottle will be left on its side for about 18 months and it will go, it'll pick up character from the leaves. They call it yeast autolysis. And so the longer you leave it, the more uh, character it will get. So the idea with, um, with traditional sparkling wines is that you have a fairly neutral base because when we describe wines, we tend to talk about things like biscuits and yeasty characters rather than fruit characters. But at Three Choirs, we're trying to get a right balance. So we produce very, very uh, fruit-driven wines here. So I think that the idea of, uh, of having a little bit of fruit character in with the complexity of the yeast really appeals to me. And so that's what we try and, try and achieve with this. So you've got an element of fruitiness as well as, uh, as, as, well as the, um, the slight complexity that you get from the, the lees aging. So the other thing is you should find this mine's still not done that well actually. You should find a fair number of bottles. And the other thing you should also look at is the size of the bottles. So in theory, uh, the can will have slightly bigger bottles than a good quality sparkler. Uh, let's have a taste. Please. So here you've got a, a lot more body in the wine, a lot more um, uh, complexity behind the initial uh, fruitiness and it really does coat the mouth more and uh, it's got greater acidity and so it just it just uh, lingers in the mouth a lot a lot more so it, it's, a, it's a far more complex wine. You see it's got good good colour on it as well that's um, partly due to its age a wine will gain more colour as it, as it gets a little bit older um, Eventually, if you keep wine for years and years and years, it will turn quite brown and then it goes a little bit like uh, sherry. So that's not quite such a good thing. But an element of aging is, is very, very good, especially in a sparkling. So this wine would be mostly 2017. Uh, we do, it is a non-vintage, so we actually use a little bit of previous vintage and uh, to, to just try and get a little bit of consistency and, and complexity. You will find some sparkling wines that stay on their leaves for a long, long time. Uh, some other English vineyards, especially in the southeast, uh, where they're on much chalkier soils, which is the, the traditional champagne soil, uh, they will be leaving their wine on the leaves for three, four, five, even, even up to 10 years. And uh, we actually did, a, the second tasting we did, we actually tried some of our um, uh, Blanc de Noir and our Pinot Noir Rosé, which were 2013 and 2014 wines, so they've been left on the leaves a lot longer. And you can really tell the difference in, in the carrot. But as I said at the beginning, the, our aim is to get the right balance between fruit character, a little bit of freshness, but, but also that, that complexity. I just feel it's wrong not to start a, a tasting with a, without a sparkling wine, so I'm afraid we, I think we've tried sparklings every time when we started. So. If you don't like sparkling wine, I do apologise, but I quite like it to cleanse the palate and set the mood. Um, another poll coming up, I think. Oh dear, no, I don't want that one. We've done that. <laughs> oh, you're all voting again. Thank you. We're going to get a different answer though, aren't we? <laughs> right. Bear with us, Houston. Yes, I don't that one. Yeah, don't bother voting on that one. I do apologise. No, don't, don't relaunch polling. Share the results and then let's move on. All right, we're going. How's it looking now? Right, I can't see it because I've still got the first one on my screen. Hang on, excuse me. Oh, yes. I'm. I'm just. I saw some of the uh, some of you on screen a little bit. If you, if you don't want to be on screen, then you can always uh, uh, take the camera off. Um, 
And uh, but I'm just interested to know when when we did our first tasting, it would, it seemed to be a lot of uh, um, smaller groups, and then I thought last time it was uh, uh, there was a few parties going on. So it was just interesting to know whether people are are staying in on their own or, or with a partner, or whether you're actually getting together and having a good party. No, no judge, no judging. <laughs> it's all anonymous, so we don't know who uh, who's who. Right, let's park the sparklings. It's, it's a very strange feeling because uh, when I'm normally tasting with people, obviously I get a little bit of feedback and uh, I might get some questions on specific things. So it must be a bit frustrating if you've got things you want to know and I'm, and I'm not telling you, I, I do apologize, but you're very welcome to email in and uh, I'll, I'll answer any pressing questions and uh, that we don't cover, we don't cover here. Or well, there might be some ideas for a, a future tasting, you never know. But there we go. I've got the to share Have you? Yes. So quite, uh, quite a lot of people who are just having a very sensible quiet night in and uh, not, um, not partying with the, uh, with the entree. So the next two wines is Coleridge Hill. And uh, you've got to be very careful because we try to put them, when we, when we put them in the case, we try to keep them fairly separate. But the only difference is the uh, vintage on the, uh, on the bottom. So make sure you've got a 2017 and a 2019. <coughs> Uh, Elaine bought me these, glasses are quite an interesting thing. Elaine bought me these up from the restaurant, which are very nice glasses, but um, I prefer to taste out of these because these, uh, these are called ISO tasting glasses and I can swill the, round, the wine around a little bit without spilling it down me quite so much. So uh, I'm a bit dangerous with one of these. So, well, um, although if I do use one of those, social distancing becomes far easier. People tend to move a long way away from me. Coleridge Hill 2017 we'll try first. I debated which way around we should try them. Quite, quite often we try the youngest wine first and then, uh, and then try an older wine because the older wine tends to maybe have a little bit more age and complexity, but well, definitely has more age. It, has, it develops a little bit more complexity as well. Uh, but I think for the, for the purposes of what we're doing tonight, I prefer to do it the other way around. So we're going to try the 2017 first. If you've got your two glasses with you, then uh, you can pour them both at the same time. Which I will do so that I can just have a look at it. Of course, if, you, if, there's a, if you're uh, working as a team, then you can always have one glass each and then swap if you're on uh, good terms. So, What's the first thing that we notice when we put them side by side? I'd wait a long time for an answer, wouldn't I? But a very, very marked difference in, um, in colour. And that's pretty usual, really. So even if I've got my bottles muddled up or my glasses muddled up, I can tell instantly which one is which. So the older wine will generally have a little bit more colour than the younger wine. What we do when we, when we make our blended wines is we don't, uh, we don't have a recipe as such because each, each year is different. So some years we will have more of one variety in than another. And that's just uh, in order to get the, the sort of similar consistency from year to year. Because these wines tend to get sold uh, around the country, so away from our, our vineyard. So we don't always get the chance to talk to people about the wine that they're trying. So people don't understand that vintages change and character changes. So we have to work very hard at trying to, trying to develop the same sort of profile uh, from year to year. And that is actually why there should be a wine in the middle here really, because we've got 17 and we've got 19. So why isn't there an 18? And the reason there isn't an 18 is because that year was so different and the grapes came in very, very ripe. And so uh, we decided there were other wines that actually needed that sort of character far more than the Coleridge Hill and, and so it would have been a change in style. So we try and make the right wine in the right year. So that is why we've got a 17 
moving on to a 19. So we've just just sold out of the 17. So the, the ones that you've got uh, in your case will be the last. You can't have any more 17, I'm afraid. So it is on to 19. But I, I'm really quite pleased with how this has stood up because 2017 wasn't a particularly good year. It was um, quite cool early on. Um, I think the weather was quite, no, no, it was, sorry, wrong way around. It was quite cool early on, but actually it, it actually got a little bit better as the season went on. But the ripening period was so short that, in fact, the grapes ripened, uh, but still left a little bit of an imbalance in the acidities. There are two acids in a wine. There's malic acid and tartaric acid. Malic acid is the less ripe acid that, that sort of dominates in, in a grape that hasn't uh, ripened fully. And it, it tends to give you characters such as apples and uh, slightly um, more bitter characteristics than the, the, the tartaric acid, which gives you freshness and crispness. So 2017 actually had quite a high level of malic acid. But that's not a bad thing because what it has done is actually it, it's allowed the wine to age for a long, long time. So this is still tasting pretty good, I think. Sorry, I shouldn't do that. Um, so it's, um, it's got just a hint of residual sugar to it, which just helps to round off and, and uh, uh, sort of temper that acidity. It's got uh, quite a lot of, um, still got a lot of freshness, I think. And uh, it's slightly more along the um, fresh, crisp Sauvignon style than it is the more um, sort of aromatic styles. So I think it would sit very well with fish dishes. Um, and it would cut through quite a, uh, quite a few sort of um, uh, cold meats as well, I think. So uh, I think it's quite a good, uh, uh, it, it's quite a good wine for some, for the right dishes. But it's probably our most popular wine, in fact. We, we make more of this wine than we make of uh, any other. Which might be why it's the most popular, because we, <laughs> we, we sell it more widely. But uh, it does seem to, uh, we, we've seen tastes go a little bit drier in recent years. So people used to like a, a lot more residual sugar in their wine than they do now. So we're making our wines um, much drier than we used to. But a, an element of residual sugar is still really, really important to give uh, that, to, to help bring the fruit character out and, and to give that balance on the, on the finish. So that's the 17. Uh, varieties in there would be uh, Madeleine Angevin, Phoenix, a little bit of Saval Blanc primarily and um, as you can tell it's a it's a sort of a complex blend but those two varieties seem to produce this style fairly regularly from vintage to vintage so uh, but the quantities might vary a bit there's more Madeleine Angevin in the 17 than there is in the 19 and that's partly because there was less Madeleine Angevin produced in 2019 but also because the Madeleine Angevin was more powerful and therefore it needed less of it uh, to, to make the same sort of style. So this is where I'm going to taste it and hope that it does not taste a million miles away. So to me, when I'm tasting it, I think we've got the, the sweetness side of it very similar. The big difference is that is the freshness. You're getting a little bit more fruit character from it, um, especially on the front. But I'm also finding it slightly, um, it's, it's got slightly less malic acid in it. So it's not, uh, it's a little bit um, kinder, a softer on the finish. And that would suggest to me that this wine is, is meant for pretty young drinking. I don't think that if I left this wine for two years, it would be as good as the 17 has been. But that's not a problem because we'll be hopefully making some more of it in 2020. So generally speaking, English wines, uh, unless you're told otherwise, should be drunk fairly young. They're better when, they're, when they've got that, that freshness and that crispness. So when we're selling to 
um, the trade, they're always looking for the latest vintages. They always want to sell the, the, the most recent vintage because the idea with English wines is it's the freshness and the lightness and the crispness that's so important to it. So, um, I'm going too slowly with my polls. We're out of sync because I was going to get you to, to vote on these two wines now, but there's another poll first. And uh, this is a bit of an experiment. So I don't know whether, I don't know how well this is going to work, but let's try it. This is going back to sparkling wine. I'm going to test your knowledge on uh, bottles. So there's three questions. And I didn't know the answers before I looked them up. So anybody that gets this right, without cheating, by the way, you're not allowed to get on your phone and uh, find the answers out. So there's three questions here. The first one is, what comes next? You have a standard Champenoise bottle, which is the 75 centiliter that we've been trying. The next size up is a, is a Magnum. And then what's the next one? You've got a choice of four. And then the next question is, what's the largest bottle of champagne called? Last, largest champagne bottle called? And then there's a third question, which I can't see because it goes off my screen. That biggest bottle, how big is it? How many bottles does it hold? This is the only, the only question that is, uh, is coming up tonight. So don't worry, I'm not gonna, it's not turning into, a, into who wants to be a, a millionaire. It's, this is the only one, but uh, we're all still, uh, still having a think about it. And I'm gonna set you one more challenge that you can do whilst we're, uh, we're tasting the other wines. But are we all done? No, it's still fine. Somebody has just joined the meeting room as well, the waiting room. So yeah, so if you if you've got a bad internet connection and you drop off, then you when you come back in, you uh, uh, you go into the waiting room and Elaine lets you back in again, as long as you haven't been naughty. So we got the results in. Still voting. Still think no, they're obviously looking it up on their phones because. Uh, you know it or you don't. <laughs> so something that might, uh, might cause you to think that the next poll that we do is I'm going to ask you to, to mark these two wines out of 10. I'm going to mark the 17 out of 10 and the, and the 19 out of 10 and we'll see which one people prefer. So the results are in. So the first question uh, most of you are, are right in that it is a Jeroboam. The second question, I'm very impressed actually that uh, so many of you did get it right, but not, not the, the most. Um, the right answer uh, was the Melcher Zedek, which I didn't know, I have to confess. If, I'd, if I was asked that question, I would have said Nebuchadnezzar. But there we are. I have it on good authority. But having said that it's a Melchizedek, how big is that bottle? How many 75 CL bottles are there in a Melchizedek? I'm not aware because it's fallen off the bottom of my screen. <laughs> Well, I do know, actually. I do know the answer. The answer is 40. It's, uh, that's the biggest bottle they do, apparently. 40 bottles in one. So, no. Okay, so that's your, your homework, your, your sort of uh, test done. I don't know if anybody got them all right, if you did. Did anybody get the last question right? Oh, Greg Bacon. Hmm? Greg Bacon. Oh, Greg Bacon, well done. <laughs> So there we go. Then. So that was that was that's the only question that isn't anonymous either. So uh, we we just wanted to do that so we knew if somebody got them all right, then we could uh, we could praise them. But uh, 
so you're if you want to I'll, I'll tell you all of the range at the end of the, the session here so if you want to carry on thinking about the order from a standard bottle right the way through to a mill yeah, then um, we'll uh, I'll tell you the exact order uh, at the end as long as somebody reminds me so next poll then uh, I want to know we, we need to decide which wine we like best out of these two so I think we're going to the next poll's coming up three two one There we go. So this is the 2017. So if you mark that one out of 10 first, and then the next poll will be mark the 2019 out of 10. Meanwhile, I'll just check these okay. These are still okay. Yep, we're all done. That's right. So what was the... Okay, if you, sorry, if you tried the 19 then. So what, I, what I'm interested to know is whether people prefer the 17 or the 18, which probably is the question I should have asked, but we can work that one out. As we go later on. So I have got the results for the 19. I've closed the poll time, so to say. Okay. Um, 35% has seven. I'm shared it, have I? No. Okay, okay. We'll um, we'll put all of those together. You, Elaine, will share them with you so you can see what I'll people thought of them, and uh, we'll uh, have a little think about what it all means at the end of it. But. Uh, it's uh, it is interesting to so that's the same wine, same sort of varieties, two years apart, and you can just see how uh, the vintage sort of varies. I, I told you about the seventeen being uh, a little bit uh, the, the ripening period was very very short, which is why it had the the higher malic acid. With the two thousand and nineteen, uh, we had quite a good early summer, and then although the temperatures weren't so bad, uh, the weather went a little bit um, uh, a little bit wet. So I think that the uh, the acidities and the sugar levels came down a little bit, uh, which is why we don't have the same amount of uh, acidity in the 2019 that we had in the in the 17. So Pinot Noir, the first first thing to make sure is you've got the right bottles because uh, there's two vintages. The the 2018 that we're trying hasn't been released yet, so I've pulled this out of the cellar and labelled up a few bottles to send to you. Uh, because we haven't had the labels done yet, you have got um, a sticker over, which should say, say the 2018. If that sticker's fallen off, uh, then the next stage is to look at the tops because the 2017 has a black capsule on it, the 2018 has no cap on it. So hopefully you can tell the difference fairly easily. And the next challenge is that it's got cork in it, which is uh, one of the things that normally I get caught out with because uh, these days I don't have many corkscrews around because we don't put many of our wines into, uh, into cork. Screw cap is by far the best uh, closure for our wines. It keeps the wine fresh. We're not looking for too much bottle aging. So uh, it's only when we're wanting wines to age a little bit in bottle uh, that we would use a cork. So these two wines have got a cork in, which leads us on to corkscrews. 
And uh, I remember when we used to put all of our wine into, uh, uh, into corks, that we used to get quite a few complaints from people saying that the wine was corked. And in fact, it wasn't corked, it just had a bit of cork in it. And normally the cork was put in there by a fairly poor corkscrew, because a corkscrew is supposed to follow one line. So if it doesn't follow the same line, if it gets bent or, or whatever, then it will chew the cork up in the middle and just push a, push a little bit out through the bottom. So from a winemaking point of view uh, and the complaints department, I was delighted when screw caps came along. But you do get different, you also get different sorts of screw cap, uh, of corkscrew. This one is a lever one. So actually when you put the cork, the, the thing in, uh, the, the, the corkscrew, when you pull it out, you're pulling it out at an angle, which can sometimes cause the cork to break as well. So a lot of people now use these uh, ones that go in straight. So this is a safer way of getting your cork out because it will go in straight and it will lift it straight as well. So in order to avoid any embarrassment online, I shall use this one. So uh, we're going to try the 2017 first and then we'll try the 2018. You can pour them both. We can talk about temperature because I, I think actually this is a wine that could be slightly chilled, but they're quite light flavors. This is actually I mean, on the label, it says Pinot Noir Precoce. Precoce uh, is a term that we have to put on the label. There's a, a, a long story, we better not get started on legislation in the EU too much because we've got to finish at eight o'clock. But um, it's uh, one of the things, when we planted uh, these vines, we planted them and called them Fruburgunder because that's what the Germans call early Pinot Noir. Because we called it Fruburgunder, the Wine Standards Board, who are our um, uh, prefects, if you like, they're, they're the people that look after what we're doing and make sure we do it all right. They told us that we couldn't call it Pinot Noir, that we had to call it Fruburgunder. And we said, well, that's not very friendly to our uh, customers. They don't really know what Fruburgunda is. So can't we call it Pinot Noir? And they said, no, no, it's not Pinot Noir, it's Fruburgunda. We said, well, that translates literally as early Pinot Noir. So can we call it early Pinot Noir? And they said, no, you can't call it early, but if you want, you can call it Precoce. And of course, Precoce doesn't mean anything to anybody other than the fact that when I tell you that it means early, this is an early clone of Pinot Noir. So there you go, there's bureaucracy at its best. Um, so this is the 2017 first. You remember that uh, I said that the 2017 wasn't the, uh, the easiest year to get ripeness. Well, early Pinot Noir does ripen very, very early and we always harvest it in the first half of September. So it's a great variety to have. But with this particular wine, I decided uh, quite early on that I liked the fruit character, but I, and so I didn't want to leave it on the skins too long to develop too much more character. And in one way I regret it because people do taste a little bit with their eyes and it is quite light. So uh, I've, I don't apologize for it, but it is a light Pinot Noir. And that's why I think that actually slightly chilled in the summer, it's, it's quite a nice drink and my, the whole reason that it's light is because I wanted to try and keep the fruit character into it. If you compare it with the 2018, which is a, a much, much hotter year, you can see we've got a little bit more colour in there. I've done the same thing in that I didn't want to leave it on the skins too long, but it has got far more colour and my camera's not very... Uh, so when you hold it up to the... it's more, more obvious when you hold it up to the light actually uh, and look through. So you've got two different vintages, single variety wine, so it's exact kind of the, the grapes have come from exactly the same vines, just in two different growing seasons. Obviously you've got a little bit more age in the 17, uh, approximately 12 months, and uh, uh, it's got a cork in it, so it's meant to be aging a little bit. Let's have a try. So there's still a little bit of acidity in there, which I quite like, which sort of matches the, the lightness. Uh, the fruit character stayed there. It's got um, 
um, real really good length to it but it's so it sort of almost deceives you and you're if you put a blindfold on and tried it i think that uh people would uh, uh would expect it when they took them off again to expect it to be a little bit darker than it is but it is still i, I quite accept it's a very light pinot noir and we can have arguments over whether it's almost a rosé in, in some cases but it's been made as a red wine it's been through the same techniques that we would use in a red wine it's just that it didn't stay on the skins for very long i only left it on the skins for three or four days whereas normally i would with our other red wine it would stay that would stay on the skins for anything up to 10 days so in 2018 i left a little bit longer but the grapes came in slightly riper as well so we got slightly higher alcohol even though the back labels that we've got on here now will say the same because i've borrowed them from the other vintage uh, this will be a slightly higher alcohol when it comes out. Try it as well. So Pinot Noir is, is pretty versatile. Uh, we've got, um, uh, we make Pinot Noir as a sparkling. You can make it as a sparkling white. Uh, which we tried at the last tasting. You can you can have it as a, a sparkling rosé. Uh, you can even make still white out of it, but most people would make a delicate rosé as a still wine by just soaking it on the skins. Uh, but these are two examples of, of red. We also grow a Pinot Noir, uh, a traditional Pinot, so it's a later ripening one. So that's the one that I tend to use in the sparkling because that will have higher acidities. But here you're tasting very much the difference between the two the two summers. Uh, I believe that the, it wasn't just the rainfall, uh, sorry, it wasn't just the temperatures, it was also the rainfall. Uh, there was significantly less rain in 2018 uh, and there was significantly more sunshine. And I think that the temperatures were, uh, I think sunshine was nearly 20% higher than average. And uh, the average growing season temperatures were one and a half degrees higher than average which is a huge amount. I mean, when you start talking to environmentalists about uh, a difference of a degree, that has huge implications. So it really was uh, a one-off for us, but uh, it's, um, it was quite interesting to, and, and quite a challenge actually, to try and make, not, not so much with the Pinot Noir, because it's a red wine that, that benefits from the extra temperatures, but the, but the white wines were more of a challenge. I'll take you back to the, the Coleridge Hill where we actually didn't make any 2018 because we just couldn't get the balance right for it. So each season has its, uh, has its complexities that we have to deal with. So there is a, a couple more polls coming out to see which one you like best of those. Well, not just what, if you'd like to mark those out of 10, they'll come up on the screen in a minute and we can uh, see what people think of those. Somebody asked me uh, beforehand that, that uh, uh, they said that they bought some of our Pinot Noir in 2011. And uh, we have been growing Pinot Noir Precoce since probably the early, early 2000s. Uh, there's no doubt that the climate has changed a little bit that's allowed us to, uh, to grow more red varieties. But I think also our expertise in the winery has developed as well. So we're better able to uh, uh, to cope with um, red, red, red wines. The 2011 worked quite well. We, it's a wine I don't make every year, so uh, there isn't going to be a 2019 because I was just lacking the acidity structure and the rightness. So because neither of those were really there, I didn't feel that it was right to make a 2019. So uh, We'll, we've pruned hard to try and restrict the crop and this year to try and bring out some really ripe fruits so that we can make a, a, a Pinot Noir 2020. How's the polling looking? So you're doing the 17 and then after that you'll do the 18. The um, uh, food pairing, that's an interesting one for this wine. Um, I think that uh, there aren't many cheeses that would go really well with it. I think maybe a little bit of cream cheese uh, might go quite nicely with it. There's, there's a little bit of um, bitterness in the wine, which would cut through some, some of the creamy cheese quite nicely, I think. Uh, 
I think it goes quite nicely with lamb as well. Uh, uh, somebody asked me that uh, um, uh, about pairing beforehand, and, and I think I replied and said, why don't, why don't you try it with a little bit of lamb? I think it can, can work quite well, probably especially the 2018. Sorry, then. All oh, right. Elaine said red currants, in case you were wondering. <laughs> Okay. So, what would you say the consensus is between seventeen and eighteen? Is there a preference? Mm -hmm. Highest mark is 38%, and that's for 2000. Uh, which one did you try first? 17 was first in the. Yeah, so 2018 is slightly more popular. Okay, interesting. I'm not surprised. I mean, I, I am very pleased with the 18. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, and I know it's not, a, it's not a particularly objective tasting because I'm influencing you with my words. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm almost persuading you that the 2017 is uh, is good because I like it. Um, but as I say, if I had my time again, I think rather than leaving it for three days on the skins, I might have been braver and left it for another day or two to try and get just a little bit more colour. Because it's actually a, it does have a, the, the juice is slightly pink in the, in the Precos version. Pinot Noir has a very, very light white juice. So the way that with traditional uh, red wine varieties, even like Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot, is they're red grapes with the white juice. So you actually extract the colour from the skins by fermenting them on the skins. But if you ferment it on the skins, you also bring out some of the other things like tannins. And when you get tannins, if you don't have a real body, real ripe fruit in the wine, then tannins can actually overtake it and, and make it a little bit uh, difficult to drink. So I think that's why I I err on the side of caution with my skin contact because I don't think that our wines need too much tannin. They're meant, these are still meant for relatively young drinking. But I wouldn't have any worries about a Pinot Noir 18 being laid down for two or three years, and um, possibly even longer. I think it's that sort of, sort of wine where it, was, it came from a good vintage, everything was right with it. And those wines tend to last uh, for quite a long time. So that just leaves us one little lonesome wine, just to show, just to sort of bring us full circle really back to where we started. And then I'm gonna to have to tell you uh, all of the bottles. Yeah. So this red wine is, this is actually, although we don't, we don't put the vintage on our cans, um, but uh, this is a 2018. So it's, a, uh, it's actually a blend very similar to our Raven's Hill, but we've just treated it slightly differently when it went into bottle, uh, into can, just because it was meant for very, very quick drinking uh, or early drinking. It's a blend of Rondo and Regent, two red varieties that we grow here that very few people have heard of. Uh, the difference is, having told you that Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot and all of these red varieties have a white juice, these two have a red juice. So it allows me to make quite a deep colored red wine without too much skin contact again. So I'm making a red wine uh, that doesn't have the, um, the, 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 the really heavy tannins to, to overtake the fruit character. So in, I'd say it's especially so with reds. I always think that uh, red wine made in England it reflects the fruit that we grow in this country as well. We're, we're always trying to match wine and describe it in fruit character terms. And uh, the, 
the red wines especially i think replicate uh, sort of resemble the the grape the, the, the fruit that we grow over here so things like uh, damsons cherries raspberries the slightly more bitter fruits uh, rather than the the really full ripe uh, red fruits that you get in, in hotter climates so again i think this could be slightly chilled we go back to the idea of the can being a being a single serve so in the handbag or in the uh, uh, picnic basket it's uh, an ideal sort of uh, uh, a complement to uh, to your journeys so we've actually um, gone through these fairly quickly and fairly well I hope you haven't felt that it's been too much of a rush there will be uh, I hope if everything's gone well we've, we've got through this without losing power so far which is a, a, um, a definite improvement on last time when I went uh, I went off screen halfway through uh, so hopefully this this can be um, edited and videoed and, and put put onto the uh, uh, onto the site for you to, to to look at again if you'd like to for those of you that had the 12 pack um, for those of you that have the six pack I apologize but the, the 12 pack also contained the cigarette that I mentioned earlier so I've got uh, Sigareva 2017 and 2019. Again, the only difference is the, uh, the vintage on the label, as far as the appearance is concerned. Uh, the 2017 has just finished, so we are just moving on to the 18. And so when you taste them, uh, this is a, a similar comparison between the, the, the Pinot 17 and 18. You've got a 17 and 18 Sigareva to try. And so 18, the Sigareva, uh, we picked it's the earliest we've ever picked. We started picking on the 30th of August in 2018, and Sigareva was the first were the first grapes to come in. So uh, that was sort of a, a record-breaking year. So they're very ripe grapes, very full and, and aromatic char character. Uh, the 17 we've spoken about the, the weather patterns there. A slightly later vintage, so we didn't pick this until the middle of September, uh, but um, it's lasted really well. So. This is actually tasting really, really well, even though we're just about to run out of it. So the last thing is to uh, let you know the uh, order of the bottles for the, uh, for the sparkling wines. These questions always come up on quizzes, so it's very useful to know. Um, and I've got the answers somewhere. I'm not gonna try and remember them myself because I discovered some, some strange things. So, the smallest bottle you can get is a quarter bottle. That's, uh, we call it a quarter bottle, but it's uh, only 20 centiliters. So that's a little bit like a can, same size as a, a can. You commonly get those on airlines and uh, uh, a little bit of um, a sort of deli type of entree things. Then you get a half bottle, which is the dummy. And then you go to the standard champenoise bottle. Now we get quite serious. We go from Magnum to Jeroboam, from Jeroboam to Methuselah, so Methuselah is a six litre. Salmanazar is a nine litre. Balthazar is a 12 litre. And then Nebuchadnezzar is a 15 litre. And I did sort of uh, um, volunteer that I would have gone for a Nebuchadnezzar as being the biggest bottle. But actually, there are four others ending in the Melchizedek. And the three of them I haven't really heard of before, and I don't think that they are really readily available, but they do exist. One is a Solomon, which is 18 litres. Uh, the Sovereign is a very strange size bottle. That's 26.25 litres, uh, and that's 35 bottles. And then there's a Primat, which is 27 litres, and that's 36 bottles. So that's what my research has shown. If you would like to surf the internet and prove me wrong then please email me but uh that's what i found <laughs> and as i say well that's an interesting Lynch just said how do you pick them up and pour them well i, I think probably you don't uh, with the, the cost of the actual bottle is phenomenal uh because they are uh, they have to be extremely strong and actually once you get above a magnum the fermentation doesn't happen in the bottle so they ferment what the, what the way they do it is they probably use uh, magnums to do the fermentation in bottle and then they transfer it from the bottle into a tank and then re-bottle it into a big bottle uh, and 
that's just because the pressures that would be involved in doing a second fermentation oh, okay. would be <laughs> huge. The Bacons have got a very large bottle. Ah, there we are. Somebody's is. holding up a very big bottle. We 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 filled some. Uh, we try we tried to be very clever in the year two thousand in that we bought uh, uh, we bought a load of um, the biggest bottle we could get at the time, which I think was a Balthazar, and we tried to fill that and. Uh, uh, it was one of those things that uh, we regretted ever trying to do. Uh, it was very, very difficult without without all of the equipment and being able to chill everything down uh, to very low temperatures. It was it was impossible. So uh, uh, the danger is you lose too much of the fizz, and then it's uh, it doesn't keep that well anyway. So I think if you're wanting a big bottle, then you actually probably order it for a for an event. And whilst it's quite nice to have a a big bottle in the in the corner of the room. Is probably in terms of quality not as good as having uh, uh, a load of magnums, but uh, they're fantastic things to look at, and the glass is so heavy as well. So uh, I don't know what size uh, is being shown at the moment, but uh, we'll, we'll maybe we'll find out. It's certainly bigger than the magnum. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that's uh, I've, well, I have to stop now because I think I've told you everything I know, uh, and I'll start making things up if I carry on. I think we're nearly at, we're nearly at time anyway. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I'm sorry that we've been in the lab and uh, not uh, sat out in the vineyard like we managed to do the last couple of times, but the weather just isn't quite uh, kind enough and the wind would have meant that the microphone would uh, would uh, pick up quite a lot of uh, uh, noise, I think. So I think this was a, a safer place to do it. Uh, I've uh, opened a lot of bottles. Uh, if, you're, um, if you've opened a lot of bottles and you're not... Uh, planning on finishing them all tonight, then uh, my recommendation to you is, certainly for the sparkling wine, there are uh, there are things you can get which are very good. Uh, I can't find one now. It's probably at home on that. I stole my uh, one the other day. Typical, I can't find one when you're looking for it. But it's a... Um, uh, basically, it fits over the top and it, and it, it sort of uh, fastens shut. Ah, there we go. Uh, so uh, they're very good. Keep the wines, once you've opened them, keep them in the fridge. Uh, I would say even probably the, the reds, don't be afraid to put them in the fridge for a little bit. Not, not for too long, but uh, and then pull them out before. They'll keep better at lower temperatures. And the other thing you can get actually is these, um, uh, these little uh, rubber things which go in and you can create a little bit of a vacuum. They're very, very good. But if you don't have any of that and you just put a, a, a top back on, store them in the fridge, they really should be good for uh, two or three days without a problem, even up to a week. So uh, don't feel that you've got to, to rush too much and, and empty the bottle. Uh, as I say, thank you very much for joining us. We're, we're, if, the, if the enthusiasm is there and you've enjoyed it and uh, you'd like us to do another one, please let us know. Uh, we probably will have a, a little bit of a break through the summer months, through August. Uh, but I'm thinking maybe we'll do a, a, a tasting sort of just around the start of harvest and things, and then maybe we can show you a few things with grapes and uh, a little bit more stuff that we do in the lab here as well. So uh, we'll see what we can do with that. Um, thank you very much. Enjoy uh, enjoy the rest of the summer. Uh, I hope that you can all get out and about a little bit more and, and keep safe. But uh, thank you very much for staying in tonight and tasting our wines. And uh, a good idea would be to... Say cheers, thank you, and um, good night. <laughs>